Are you a professional in the music industry and frustrated with all the legal issues that you must deal with all the time? Well, let us help you. At The Fine Law Firm, we've helped people just like you, entertainers, weave their way through the legal issues that you face. Eric Fine has over 10 years of experience working with entertainers just like you. From copyrights to royalty agreements, to venue agreements, anything that's involved with your business, Eric Fine can help you. You can easily reach Eric at 214-522-9596 or find us on the internet at ericfinelaw.net. That's fine, F-E-I-N law.net. Eric Fine, ready to help you with anything you may face. Get out there and do your music thing and leave the legal issues to us. Eric Fine Law, 214-522-9596. Call us today, Eric Fine Law. Hey everybody, it's The Trout and welcome to The Trout Show. Thanks for joining us today. Before I get started today's episode, I want to talk to you about new episodes I have coming out every Monday now. It's called New Music Mondays, where I give you an opportunity to listen to new music from artists, whether independent or well-known. So you can listen to those every Monday on my channels, whether it's podcast or YouTube. So today's episode, I took a little different track, and that is the track that I'm not talking to a musician per se, but I am talking to a great bass player. And he's one of the most premier bass teachers and players in America. His name is John Liebman. John sat down and talked to me about his career, which is very interesting in all the years that he played bass in so many different types of bands. But then he decided he wanted to start teaching people how to play bass, whether it's country, whether it's funk, whether it's rock, all that. And John has spent several years having multiple books out and multiple videos about helping people learn how to play bass. It's a very intriguing story. But on top of that, his company and his friends have interviewed over 800 musicians on his channel, which you can find at jodlima.com. So I think you're going to enjoy this episode where we talk about bass and talk about music and talk about all great things what comes from great musicians like John Liebman. So up next, the guy that knows how to play bass really good. That's John Liebman. That's next on The Trout Show. Hi, I'm John Liebman. I teach bass. Wouldn't you love to lay down a bass groove in your favorite style of music? maybe a little rock or some blues. Whatever the style, playing bass is fun. So tell me a little bit about what you do in your history of what you've been doing and all that good stuff. Well, I'm not sure how far back you want me to start, but I'll, I'll tell you all you want to know. First, let's start with something simple. Where were you born? Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. And uh, my dad was a rock and roll DJ in the 50s and 60s. Oh, wow. So my earliest childhood memories are in Cleveland. And uh, he was one of the pioneers. He had a, a morning show, just like so many others had in the, I guess, 70s, 80s, 90s, beyond oh, yeah. 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 people listening to radio. And uh, he worked for a, uh, oh, you know what? He, he started as a uh, staff announcer for NBC. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know what he hosted a, a movie show on TV. So that was the local affiliate in Cleveland, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The NBC affiliate. And yeah. then uh, the station was sold to Westinghouse Broadcasting in, I don't know, 1956 or something like that. And uh, they, they changed his name. They gave him a very zippy name, something they thought was very cool back in those days. <laughs> And uh, his his name he went by Jerry Liebman. Okay, that's okay. my dad. It was my dad, Jerry Liebman. And then when uh, Rock Nation said we're going with this new format, it's called Rock and Roll, and they wanted one syllable first names, two syllable last names. And uh, so, how did it all come about? You know, uh, somebody looked at him. He wore thick glasses, so somebody said specs. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Specs. Specs Liebman. Well, it 
still didn't quite have the ring <laughs> to it. No. So that's what I said. One syllable first names, two syllable last names. Sometimes it was the reverse. One of the guys went over to the phone book and he went, mm, Yeah. Howard. And he went by Specs Howard. He went Specs home, Howard. told my mother she said, Specs Howard. You can Google it now. He he was in radio for many years. And then right in the middle of the school year, I was in first grade. The guys from the ABC affiliate in Detroit came and talked to my dad and his partner. And they said, we want you to come to Detroit. And I said, Detroit, you know, why would I want to uproot my family? Well, yeah. they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Couldn't refuse. Packed up and moved to Detroit. And uh, that's that's where I've been since, uh, that's where I grew up, since four days before I turned seven. Oh, and I remember when it was the night before we were actually moving into the house. So we stayed at a hotel the night before, and my dad had to go in, talk to the real estate people or whoever it was in the office. And he came, he came out, he says, you kids are not going to believe this. You know who just bought a house right down the street from where we're moving in? No, who, dad? Mitch Ryder. Remember Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels? Oh, absolutely. I used to play uh, Jenny, whatever was that, a couple of, Devil Jenny, with a Blue Dress or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Devil with a Blue Dress and Good Golly Miss Molly. So yeah. that was what we used to go over his house and bug him. <laughs> My brother said, I played football with Mitch Ryder. We used to play. <laughs> so that's, uh, all you asked me was, where was I born? And I'm already. Uh, that's all right. So, so where are you now? I'm in Michigan. Okay. okay. Again, and uh, I was down in Florida for six years, and I was out in LA for a while. And uh, I came back. My dad actually started a school for radio and TV broadcasting. That's where everybody in the Detroit area, you know, everybody in the Detroit area grew up with Specs Howard School of, used to be broadcast arts, and then we wow. changed to media arts. And I don't know, last time anybody counted, 15,000, 18,000 graduates wow. working facets of radio tv video production digital media graphic design i ran the school for many years cool and i left when i i started my company so uh my wife and i about oh, about two and a half years ago moved to mid michigan we have a daughter here about about exactly 6.9 miles away and she's there with her family and my son is in chicago so we're close that's not to too far yeah yeah so what else do you want to know? I've... Well, what's funny about it is your your dad was a rock guy, so yeah. he kind of grew up during the doo wop period. But yeah. obviously, Detroit's known for one major thing, Motown. Motown. Yeah. So here's a guy that, and but but I also I believe uh, that at the same time you had, of course, you had the beginning of rock coming through anyway. You had the '60s and it was all the Beatles and all the uh, British Invasion all started at the same time. Motown took off. And then that little thing called Vietnam started everything yeah, rolling. I, I was young, but I remember that all very well. Oh, yeah. you know, what, my first introduction to me, it, it was such a cool way to grow up. I was six years old, and my dad took us to see the Dave Clark Five, ah. Love and Spoonful, the Association. All the cool groups. The Beatles. I saw the Beatles at Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, where the, the Browns played and where the Indians played. And I, I, I've told people, I said, I don't know if I was the only six year old there, but I was definitely the hippest because <laughs> I knew where I was yeah. and I knew who they were and I oh, knew yeah. music and I knew, and we were at one concert somewhere. I was a little kid and I leaned over to my mom. I said, what, what did he say? The name of this song is, she says, Papa got a brand new, a new bag. bag. I said, a new bag. <laughs> but I remember thinking, okay, okay, let's see what this is. But uh, then, then we got a piano in the house, and we all took piano lessons, and uh, there were always lots of guitars around the house for some Oh, reason. yeah. Did I, your dad play, too, or he just... No, he used to talk about how he wanted to take saxophone lessons in third grade and there was just no money and uh, his his good friend ended up taking lessons and he went on all through school and he played in the band and my dad, my dad never did, but he was musical and I can tell because he could sing, he could carry a tune and, and he could yeah. uh, sing in time, but uh, it was uh, a some very exciting things. I'm glad that uh, even though I was so young, I'm glad that I'm able to remember that. And I remember going backstage, not at the Beatles, but at some of the other shows 
and it was just a, just a very cool way to grow up. And my, I'm the youngest of four. My uh, oldest sister is not very musical, but my brother and my other sister are both very musical. My brother right. and I played in bands together. That's how I started playing bass. You know, I've, I've interviewed over 800 bass players. And oh, my almost, gosh. John. Almost everybody has the same story. Well, I wanted to play guitar, but they were already <laughs> more than enough guitar players. Yeah. So my story was, well, you could play guitar and not be in the band. Or you can play bass and be in the in band. a band. So you you started. You worked for your dad or did that for a long time, and then then did you? You played in a lot of bands. What were you cover band or what? What did you do? You obviously played bass. You went on and because that's what you do now. You talk to people that play bass. Yeah. Well, the thing with my dad was after the the big stuff that I did in music, and uh, there's, there's a lot involved there. But when I I went to college and I, I, I don't know, maybe I just didn't have the guts to declare a major in music. So I just started, I was taking English, science, math, and oh, I'll take music theory. And then it's like, oh, I'll take the next music there. I'll take history. And then actually at the end of my first year, my freshman year, the, the professor said, uh, we're, we'd really like to bolster the department and look strong to the administration. So uh, anybody that would want to declare or is considering declaring a concentration in music, it would really help us out. I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that's uh, all right. Yes, I'm going to be a music major. And at the time, music, this was University of Michigan. Okay. It was the Dearborn campus, it wasn't in Ann Arbor. It was still U of M. And uh, the, the schools were not like they are now. So I, everything still in my mind anyway was very old school and traditional. And I, I hate to use the word, but you know, legit. <laughs> so I played guitar and I had played bass and I thought, well, if I'm going to be a music major, I've got to declare an instrument and it's got to be classical guitar or classical bass. Cause that's the only way that I saw that I could be sure. a bona fide music major. Yeah. So I thought, you know what? I would, I would love to play the upright bass. I remember mm. fooling around in the band room in high school. I played guitar in the high school jazz band. And one time over in the band room, I went to pick up, I, I took an upright bass that was leaning against the wall and I tried to play it. And I don't know why I thought I'd be able to play it, but I, I just had no idea where to begin <laughs> or what to do. And uh, so I, I found a teacher. I, I just love him, Max Janowski. He passed away a few years ago, but he played in the Detroit Symphony. Mm -hmm. He started me from ground zero, and he had me with the bow and playing Vivaldi sonata. Well, eventually Vivaldi sonata yeah. and things like that. And I got into the or I transferred over to Wayne State University in Detroit, and I was in the music program there. I played in the orchestra, the symphony band, the jazz band. Really, really immersed in it. And I thought after I graduated, uh, I thought I would go to work for my dad at the school, which I did actually in mm -hmm. 1983. And I said, I actually took, it took me an extra semester to graduate. So I, I, cause I've always taken a million classes. So I graduated in December and I, I went to work for my dad in uh, January of 83. And I said, I'm never going to any school of any kind ever again <laughs> and i wanted to get back to playing guitar and there was a guy in detroit who was like the classical guitar teacher his name was joe fava like the bean yeah. and he had uh two or three stores fava's music that that people would would remember and i went to study with him but he's he's showing me classical technique but he's having me play when sunny gets blue and oh, wow. jazz standards it was very yeah. cool and I took three lessons from him and I enjoyed it very much. And I said, Mr. Fava, I really like this. And someday I'm going to learn classical guitar. But right now I've decided I'd like to continue going on the bass. And that's when I started looking around at schools. I looked at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Later on the corner was the New England Conservatory. And then I stopped, uh, I, I had my girlfriend with me, we took a drive. And then on the way back, we, we stopped at Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. Heard of it. I came home and then I went to Indiana University. And I said, oh, this is amazing. I was blown away. They have five orchestras with 90 people in each orchestra. And the kids learn their parts and everything else. So I was really excited. I thought I was going to go to, to uh, Indiana. 
And then I went out, I really wanted to go to look at the uh, Base Institute of Technology in uh, Hollywood. It's, it's part of uh, Musicians Institute now, but they used to okay. have BIT, BIT, PIT was uh, what, percussion, G was guitar. You know, so I looked at that school and uh, I thought, yeah, being in L.A., you know, yeah. And then right up the road from where you are, what used to be called North Texas State University. Which University is now, of North Texas. University of North Texas. I have friends and, up there. I thought it was it was cool. I just I don't know. It just didn't. It, it looked kind of like a big band factory to me in a way. Well, it's it's oh, obviously in the time it's it's changed a lot. Then I had one more school to visit. I don't know if I did it on the same trip or not, but uh, University of Miami. Okay. And I got there and I said, "Whoa, this is what I started out looking for in the first mm-hmm. place. Not the classical thing with the orchestra. This is the studio music and jazz." And it just really, really hit the spot. And plus they had Lucas Drew, who was the classical double bass teacher. So if I wanted to have that, you know, on the periphery of, of my studies, you know, I could do that, which I did. And I played in the orchestra and then I just started getting gigs and gigs and gigs. people were sending me. It's funny because I didn't realize until looking back that coming from Detroit, I thought of myself at a certain level and I was getting called for gigs that I, people thought I was better than I thought I was. That's what I'm trying to say. So these are gigs that I would never have expected to get called for in Detroit. And I started doing them in Miami. You do one and you do another and it's, you know, sink or swim situation. And I was so incredibly green. I was like, well, how come every time we finish it, at each, each singer, each person, whatever, it's, it says, it says, there's a page that says bows. What, why does that mean? Bows? Why do we, and then, oh, bows, when the guy comes back. I mean, that's, that's how, and I was like, how come it says B-A-J-O on every page? What is, oh, bajo, that's the bass. Okay. <laughs> so I started doing shows and I what started. Kind of, if I can ask, what kind of music were you playing? I was I got very very deeply ensconced and entrenched in the Latin scene. Oh wow! Oh yeah, I was doing a gig. I was playing a wedding or something at the Grand Bay Hotel in uh, Coconut Grove, and there was a guy there. How you doing? Uh, his name was Ray R E Y Reynaldo. Yeah, Reynaldo. Reynaldo, and uh, I had graduated from University of Miami, and in the summertime, uh, my, uh, my my first wife's mother had a uh, camping supply store so i i went to work there i don't know why i didn't just go to new york la you know i don't know i was yeah. in my and i hadn't really done that much by that time and here i am with a master's degree in music i've master's degree in jazz bass and i had, and uh and I'm, I'm on the floor of a retail store selling sleeping bags and tents and hiking boots. And I just hate in the summertime in Miami and everything is so, oh, yeah. so, <laughs> so hot. And, and the store was so quiet. You remember that song? Remember there's a, a band called Simply Red? Oh, yeah. I know that. I mean, they're Irish. He's Irish. Yeah. They had a band called Holding Back the Years. Holding yeah, Back, Holding Back the-, the Years. That was just one of his big hits. Yeah. That was popular during those days. So whenever I hear that song, I think of how miserable I was for just, I was only there maybe seven weeks or so. And I went to her one day, I said, Rita, I love you. Thank you for the opportunity. This is just not what I want to do. As, she, as you would say to Ray, adios. <laughs> well, I'm coming to Ray. <laughs> so oh, you're Okay. Yeah. So she says, I understand. I'm sorry to see you go, but you got to do what you got to do. And I didn't have anything lined up. And I went home directly from that very conversation. And I went home and I checked. Remember answering machines? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So there's a message on my answering machine from Ray. He says, John, this is Ray Sanchez. I want to talk to you about a possible gig in South America. Uh, give me a call. So I called him, and that was that was where the whole thing started. There was a yeah. pop from around Spain, the Canary Islands. His name was Braulio, and we did a tour of Colombia, and uh, I think that's all we went on that first trip. And then we started doing shows, and then we were playing at Madison Square Garden. We we're playing at the Greek Theater, and we're, we we went to Texas a bunch of times. 
and we're playing all the uh, the Latin nightclubs in yeah. in Miami back in the eighties. Yeah. And at the same time. I always wanted to play. I had some friends that played in the pit orchestras of uh, Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. I hate musicals, but I, I still, I thought that would be. I'm not a fan either. I thought that would be a fun thing to do. That would be fun work. So I started, I found out who the big contractor was, Bob Percy, P-E-R-S-I. And I started calling him and he was always very nice to me. And he said, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'll let you know, I don't have anything right now, but uh, thanks for calling. Well, Mr. Percy, would it be all right if I, if I check back with you in a couple of months just to see? Yeah, sure, sure. I did that for two years. <laughs> you didn't he, give up, though. He called me one day. He says, John, I got, I got, I got something where I need a bass player, but, but I don't know you. I said, well, you can call Don Kaufman over at the University of Miami, or you can call, he's up. Don Kaufman's good enough. So he called. That was the, the teacher at University of Miami, the right. base teacher. And uh, the show was Into the Woods. And Cleo Lane was the star. Oh, wow. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, that was amazing. And uh, so it was a big deal. It, it was uh, actually it was part of the national tour, but it was just all I knew was five weeks in mm -hmm. South Florida, three weeks in Fort Lauderdale and two weeks in Palm Beach or something like that. It was cool. Steven Sondheim came to the rehearsals. Mm. And uh, so uh, so I got to do that. And I really, really enjoyed that. That was a whole different kind of thing for me. And um, um, next thing I know, the conductor called me and asked, this is like, I don't know, a month or two later. And he asked me if I would like to do the national tour of Into the Woods. I say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So <laughs> we went to, we, where did we start? We started in Denver. Then we went to Tulsa and Des Moines and St. Louis and Cleveland. Played Heinz Hall in Pittsburgh and wow. played, uh, I, I don't know how many cities. And then uh, the last show was in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And I got back after, the, it was a 14-week run. And I got back to the hotel after the very last show of 14 weeks there and uh somehow they they found they found out where i was this was before texting and cell phones oh, yeah, yeah. none of that they got a phone number of the hotel where i was staying and it was somebody from the burt reynolds theater in jupiter florida i was gonna say i was wrong yeah jupiter i forgot about that's where it was yeah, yeah. and they needed somebody to do dream girls ah it's fun because oh because the, the bass player had to have his appendix out so one thing led to another and my name came up. So I, I did that right away. And then uh, got some, some people there that were also involved in the uh, Coconut Grove Playhouse. So I did a bunch of shows there. And then um, with uh, Bob Percy, the guy that, that called me for the first Into the Woods, he hired me as the house bassist at, uh, at the Hirschfeld Theater on Miami Beach. So I did all the shows there. We did Ain't Misbehaving with the Fifth Dimension. We did. They're playing our song. I did uh, Oliver from. Uh, with oh gosh, that goes by Oliver. Davy Jones from the Monkees. Oh yeah. And Phantom of the Opera, and uh, for some reason, it must have been because of Christmas or something. It's really weird to have a break in December in Miami because that's when things are the biggest. But I, I don't know why, but we did, and I came up to Detroit for a few days to be with my family, and my brother-in-law. Uh, owned part of a racehorse, <laughs> so so we went to the. I hope track. he had the good part. <laughs> he <laughs> owned a, a, a percentage of a yeah okay. A good <laughs> so we went to the racetrack, and I don't. I, I've been a couple of times. I don't really know anything about it. But I got back to uh, to Florida, and I okay, I'm struck about conversation with Davy Jones because I knew he was a jockey and he was in the horse. That's right, that's where he started. I said, I thought about you on our time off. My brother-in-law owns a horse. So we went to the track and I'm trying to sound like I know what I'm talking about. I said, but it's, it's a pacer, not a trotter, or it's a trotter, not a pacer. <laughs> so it doesn't go that fast. He says, yeah. well, if you'd ever been behind one, you knew, you know, they do go quite fast. <laughs> they do go rather fast. So I was the house bassist at Hirschfeld Theater on Miami Beach. 
and we would play eight shows a week. And then I would leave the theater at about, I don't know, 11 o'clock or something at night and head straight over to Little Havana and I'd play at the Copacabana. Oh, wow. Those shows didn't start till Until probably maybe, midnight. Maybe 1.30, oh, 2 o'clock. Wow. And I'd get home at you know, 4, 4.30 in the morning and, and get up and do it again. But one of the guys would go, uh, there, there was a, a restaurant next door called La Carreta, which means the wagon wheel or something like that. And they mm. had that symbol on the side of the building. Somebody would say, let's go next door for a blast. And we'd go and there was a window where you could walk up. You didn't have to go inside the building and you could order a cortadito, a cafecito, a colada, whatever. So I would yeah. describe it as, as like, 10% mud, 20% shoe polish, and 70% sugar. <laughs> and now we're going and we're playing the shows. <laughs> and then I was I was uh, writing and arranging, and I found somebody who was, uh, who was going on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So I got to write some arrangements for this. But that was, that was such a thrill. Actually, I happened to be home in Detroit again when that aired. And... Uh, uh, her name was Roz Ryan, and she's, uh, she's done a lot of Broadway, a lot of singing. And then Sandra Santiago from Miami Vice went on. Uh, there was a show called The Late Show. It was after Arsenio Hall, or maybe it was before Arsenio started. And after, I don't know, Joan Rivers had a show. I don't know. Yeah, was, Joan Rivers had a show for a while, yeah. Somewhere in that time period. So, um the band leader was Mark Hudson. Remember the Hudson brothers? Oh, yeah, the Hudson brothers. Goldie yeah. Hahn. Yes, yep. And uh, Jimmy Johnson was the bass player in the house band. So I did an arrangement for her, and they performed it on TV. The man that got away, Judy Garland, Liza Minnelli. You know. So, uh, oh, but, but with Ray Sanchez, that first trip we went, uh, the first trip to South America, we were in Colombia, and we were roommates. And I've driven a lot of roommates crazy by just sitting and slapping the bass. <laughs> One guy says, it's like somebody sticking needles. <laughs> anyway, I didn't know Ray had been listening or paying attention. And he just, I stopped for a second and he said, you ought to write that stuff down, man. Mm. You should write a book. I said, write a book? I can't write a book. No, I'm telling you, man. He, at the time, was also the... Uh, what did he do? He did something for Columbia Pictures Publications, mm. which became CPP Bellwin, which became Warner Brothers, which became Alfred Music, which is one of the big music publishing, you know, sheet yeah. music. And um, we still talk about it to this day. Ray is a very good friend of mine. I talk to him all the time. And we, we recount how we went downstairs across the street and there was a pizza place on the corner. And we're sitting outside this pizza place, you know, like cafe type of place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Colombian pizza, talking about how to write a book and how to, you know, he said, I think you should write funk bass. Yeah, that's it. Funk bass. Yeah. And, and I went home and I put down a few notes and then a few more and a few more. And then I remember shopping, or shopping it around the NAMM show. This would have been about 1991 or something okay. like that. In the old days, there was no such thing as, as a PDF. or Oh, semi. no. So I'm walking around the name. You, have, you probably have type pages or uh, a book. I had binders. Loose, loose oh, oh, yeah, binders. binders. Okay, yeah. Five of them <laughs> walking around the NAMM show. And I, I got an uh, offer right away from Warner Brothers and from Cherry Lane Music, I think, which is now part of Hal Leonard. But Hal Leonard was and is the largest print music publisher in the world yeah, been around for a long time and then i started reaching out to people i got i had gotten to know john patitucci pretty well and uh i asked him to write the foreword which he did mm -hmm. and then i got a bunch of other uh, i got Stu ham to endorse it and i got bob cranshaw and mark egan and i don't know a bunch of people i just saw Stu was playing with somebody he's always somebody <laughs> uh, well he's playing with somebody because i saw i never i heard his name before and i was going to reach out to him because i thought it might be an interesting discussion to have with him because he's played a lot but anyway go ahead i just i just happened to think about that because i just literally just saw his name the other day 
He's a good guy. When I was in LA, he came over to my house every day for like a month and we were transcribing the music on his first three albums for a Hal Leonard book. Hal Leonard asked me to do that also. And he's one of these contortionists. On the yeah. Uh, yeah. That's how the book writing thing started. And I still blame Ray Sanchez for that to this day. And then I did a second book and a third. And I just, uh, my 10th book was just published. Wow. Last- supposed to come out in 2020 but because of covid it was delayed a little bit it was supposed to come out for the summer nam show so you went from writing this book which became popular tell me a little bit about what you're what you do now i mean other than i know you interview people but you also provide opportunity you're still in the business to helping people learn how to play obviously yeah i probably should have started there with that's all right (laughs) when i got the great story to go along with it long lead in but uh I, uh, I, I, you can't really tell from looking at me, but I, I have a, uh, a neurological movement disorder. It affects the entire right side of my body. Hmm. I walk kind of funny. Sometimes I get the shakes and, uh, you know, sometimes I walk with a cane because my wife says, if you don't walk with a cane, people will think you're drunk. So I said, all right, so I'll walk with a cane and an excuse to get drunk, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, reason I mentioned that I, I had been to the Mayo Clinic three times. I've been hmm. to the Cleveland. Like I've been to a lot of doctors, and uh, I I don't know how I found out about uh, Muhammad Ali's doctor. This this is an answer to your question. You'll you'll get the answer. No, that's all right. I'm 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 fine. Go ahead. And uh, I went to visit him for ten days and visit him. I went to the hospital. What did Muhammad have? Did he have Parkinson's? Parkinson's? It's what I thought. Okay. What I have has a lot of similarities to Parkinson's, but it's it's not parkinson's so they told me so just before i left for this trip to new york trip this vacation you know this this period in new york i got an email from some kid in i think it was in england i don't know if he was a kid but he said john liebman i love your books i love your stuff i love what you do i looked all over the internet and i can't believe there's no john liebman.com And I went, (laughs) (laughs) so that's how I occupied my time in the hospital for 10 days with uh, one or two manuals and Google and YouTube and trying to figure out how to start a website without having a clue of what I was. And I launched johnleapman.com on March 1st, 2009. And just to sell my books, and here right. I am. This is, you know, and then I read an article one night about websites and marketing, and it, you know, it can't be all about me, me, me. There's got to be some compelling content, some reason for people to come, for them to get something out of it. And uh, I said, yeah, that that makes sense. So I I called up uh, GoDaddy, and I I I like the name for bass players only mm. So I bought that name, and again, without having a clue of what I was doing, I launched for BassPlayersOnly.com on uh, June 1st, 2009. Mm. Somebody said, are you you're going to do interviews? Maybe you should do interviews? And I thought, you know, I kind of thought about that. I don't know. So the site was already two weeks old when I, I published my first interview. It was Glenn Letch, who was playing with Robin Trower at the mm. time. That was the first interview. And then I did another one and another one and another one and another one. And in March of 2023, I hit number 800. That's just weeks. amazing, John. Consecutive, this, consecutive weeks. Never just, been. So uh, let me ask you a question, because obviously now you've known a lot of people that can help you get to other people. But when you started, you obviously, did you already know people in the business that you could reach out to? Or did you just start asking people? I knew a bunch of guys I went to school with right. and I, you know, I had done quite a bit and I played with, uh, I, I mentioned the fifth dimension and I yeah. mentioned, you know, a lot of the Latin people. Who else did I play with? Oh, I did another big show on Miami beach with, uh, uh Eartha kid oh. and, and Eddie Fisher and Donald O'Connor and oh, yeah. Andrews from the Andrews sisters. And it was a show with Jackie Mason. Oh gosh. Oh, oh. God, the, the same routine night after night. It's oh, yeah. as, as if you're hearing it for the first time. It was so funny. 
and then uh, the ink spots, you know, so, so you, you meet a lot of people, not, yeah. not, I'm not talking about the stars, but the other people that, that I played with and, um, and the time I spent out in LA. So I had known a lot of people, but I don't know how I just, I guess I started Ed Friedland was interview number two, who was also you know, number 800. I think eh, it's not too soon to do a follow-up with him. Yeah. No kidding. And I just started reaching out to people. Leland Sklar got back to me, Chuck Rainey. Who have you interviewed? You haven't interviewed that you want to, but you can't get to do anything. Who's your, who do you want to see? Who do you want to interview? You know, we already got Paul McCartney, Getty Lee, Sting, you know, all these people. Um, Carol Kay I interviewed. By the way, I, I didn't personally interview all of those. I've interviewed you know, 99% of the ones, right. but I published all those exclusive one-on-one -on -one interviews. I've right. got a Gary Graff, who is very, uh, he's, he's a very seasoned writer. Oh, seasoned makes him sound old. What? He's old. <laughs> uh, Stanley Clark. I've I've met him. I've talked with him. I've gotten to know him. I've talked to his people, and uh, he always says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it." Yeah, you can't get him to do it. I I reached out to his uh, manager just the other day. I said, "Are you still with Stanley?" Yeah. All right, let, let's make it happen. So I think that's going to happen. Did you get Victor Wooten? Oh, wow, four times. We hung out together in Germany. We went to the Warwick base camp. And I'm, I'm in there. Warwick makes beautiful uh, instruments. And uh, they invited me. They had, uh, I went like three or four times. And they'd have like Robert Trujillo from Metallica. So we sat down and did an interview. And uh, who all was there? Phil Chen uh, interviewed him three or four times. But uh, we were in, uh, my first trip to Germany was 2014. And I'm sitting in the showroom of uh, Warwick. Warwick. Where yeah. And I'm playing and I was really into learning how to tap. Mm -hmm. I was excited as about, about tapping now as I was about slapping back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure it out and I'm doing this. And, and all of a sudden I felt like somebody's watching me and I go like this. I look over and it's Victor Wooten standing right here. There's nobody it's else. Mr. Slap himself. And I said, hi. And he said, well, not slap, tap is what I was oh, doing. Oh, tap, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, do you mind if I make a few observations? <laughs> <laughs> no. So he showed me some stuff uh, that his oldest brother, Reggie, had taught him. And wow. the, the biggest takeaway was Reggie always told me, keep in mind, whatever the left hand can do, the right hand can do. And I'm like, Wow. That's an interesting thing. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's true. And on another one of those Warwick trips, Billy Sheehan came up to me one night and he says, you're going to be around tomorrow. Uh, you, want me, you want to get together? I'll show you some stuff. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, so he sat down with me just one-on-one -on -one for like an hour and a half. And my son was there, so he got it all on, on video. Did your son know who he was? Oh, yeah. My okay. son my son is killing it. He just graduated in 2022 from Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Oh, what's he so play? He plays guitar, and he's also a very good bass player. He doesn't sound like a guitar player playing the bass. He sounds yeah, like that a, was hard for me to learn how not to do that. Because yeah, it's he, like, you're a lead guitar player, aren't you? Yeah, well, we don't play bass like that. <laughs> the two bass players that I wish I could talk to are no longer with us. John Entwistle. Yeah. And... Um, the yes guy, Chris Squire. Chris Squire. I interviewed Chris. I I just John Inchwistle was yep. just big a phenomenal ox. big ox. Yep. And Chris Squire always like, you know, I always tend to go with people that are, when it comes to bass, and McCartney, that's why I like McCartney, because you listen to old stuff, he's playing way up high and playing stuff, not just doing the stuff that was popular back then. But John went, of course, he had to fill in for the three-piece band, which made it sound like there was five people on there. Getty Lee's the same way. People say, you know, you go to the, well, they're not going to see him anymore, but they go to him and go, how could three guys make that much sound Oh, let's, like? let's, add, let's add John Paul Jones to my oh, list. Oh, yeah, John Paul Jones. But I've yeah. gotten far near everybody else. Well, and that's just amazing to me. And I, and I, I assume that in, in what you're doing that, you have a, you obviously you have a great reputation because people won't i mean we all know the music industry if they trust you it's like anything else if they trust you they'll talk with you 
You know, if they think well, I, okay. Paul McCartney was looking for a boost to his career, so that's why. He, yeah, <laughs> as if he he struggled so much. <laughs> but, uh, so getting uh, John, back. John, can you help me out here a little bit? I'm just having trouble. You know, it's <laughs> you sound more like John than Paul. Yeah, that's I can't do McCartney. I can do John Lennon. I can't do McCartney. And, 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 but I mean, what's really intriguing to me about you is the fact that you've been successful doing this and People you can love to talk about themselves. Oh, I'm absolutely. Always, I'm always on the other end. I'm asking the question. I know. I'm That's why this is so much fun for me because I, when you started up, I just kind of went go. I don't care because I think, you know, you I'm don't get a doing out 14 years of pent up. You know? <laughs> well, and you don't have the opportunity. I, you know, I, if I'm interviewing somebody, it's somebody. all about them, you know, and it, and nobody wants, it sounds like, you know, don't care about me. You know, just funny. Sometimes people go, oh, how long is the interview going to be? Or, yeah. uh, and then you ask them questions and people like to talk about themselves. So, you you know, out of all the interviews between the, the bass player interviews and the guitar, I have another site called for guitar players only. Oh, wow. So between all the bass players and guitar players, probably you know close to a thousand interviews, there was only one person that was not nice, and I'm not going to mention. No, I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> I'd have to cut it out anyway, so I'm not going to ask you. But I'm but, sure I know who that person was or is. What I do, I have a site called for bassplayersonly.com, and most of my audience is men in their fifties, sixties, and seventies who have always wanted to play bass. Mm. A few of them are beginners, but most of them have dabbled with it on and off over the years. Right. Of the classic rock and soul and R&B from the 60s and the 70s. A lot of times they have arthritis or tendonitis or other mm. things that happen to our bodies when we get into our 50s, 60s. Oh, yeah. you no know, shoulder. and, and yeah. there's some I Wake up in the morning and why is this hurt that I didn't hurt yesterday? Yes. I didn't even know I had this. Yeah. <laughs> So they want to be able to, to groove. And a lot of them have the misconception that you, you have to be, you know, you're talking about Stuart Ham, Stu Ham before, you know, you don't yeah. have to do that. You can, do, do, you can play a James Jamerson Motown groove without playing all the notes that Jamerson played. And the same for McCartney or Chris Squire or Jock, well, Jocko. I don't know, he was Jocko, yeah. Himself, but I, I've got some Jocko stories too. But um, So I have a membership where people come and they learn, they, they go through all the different courses and the, the courses are in uh, various kinds of technique and various genres. And I also have courses in scales and theory and sight reading and a course called basics, the two S's and uh, be clever. But I also, yeah, how about that? <laughs> and then, um, you know, right now I'm in the process of breaking up the rock course into four different courses. And I'm going to have... I, I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> the early videos that I did in 2012, before I launched the site in 2013, the the, uh, the uh, instructional part, I should say, the original, it was 2009, like I said, but I have gotten a lot better at it. Oh, sure. <laughs> it yeah. So much. And plus reaching out, I, I was under the mindset of just, this is what I want to have. And this is what I want the people to, to have. No, you've been in sales and marketing, so you know how no that is. Yeah. You got to know what the people want and give them what they want. Yep. And, and I'm redoing it and breaking it up into uh, the first course, which I'm getting ready to launch within a week, is called Early Rock. And that's in the styles of Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry. Oh, the early stuff. Okay. The 50s. And, yeah. And then into the 60s, like early Beatles and you know, those kinds of things. The second course is going to be classic rock. Rock had matured a little bit. The third course is called hard rock slash metal. And I have a course now called soft rock, but I'm going to redo that also to make it consistent with the uh, framework that I've been honing and developing, my groove grower framework, which is a theme and variations. You start out with a very simple groove. And then the next variation is just a little bit more complicated than the next one's a little bit more complicated. Mm. So by the time you get to the last one, you're still playing the same groove and it's not to show off and go crazy. It's to show you a little bit of what's possible and to build your technique, but always, always, always 
give the music what it needs, serve the song. If it's if the song needs you to play busy, play busy. Most of the time it doesn't. Mm-mm. Calls for one five one five. Don't say, oh, it's just one five one five. It's no it is a big deal. I want you to give me the best one five one five. Are you playing in time? Are your articulations good? Are you watching your note releases, not just the attacks? Are you playing it in time? Are you playing it consistently? Can you play it for a long time and keep it up? You know, all those kinds of yeah. things. And I have uh, a digital course called Power Grooving, which goes really deep into several different styles. It's kind of the mirror image of the membership. The membership is called the Bottom Line Club. And that's what I just described. Power Mm -hmm. is the mirror image of the Bottom Line Club. Whereas in the Bottom Line Club, you pick a style or a genre that you want to learn and you play a bunch of different grooves in that style. Mm -hmm. Bottom Line Club, you take a chord progression and you take that same chord progression and you play it like a rock beat. You play it like a shuffle beat. You play it like oh, a country. Okay. Gotcha. Punk army, you know. So yeah. that was a major, major undertaking. And I've got a couple of mini courses and I'm working on a brand new digital course right now. I can't really talk about it too much. It's in the works. I'm doing what's called validation calls. And I reached out to a bunch of my students and, and asking them, first of all, what, what is your biggest frustration? What do you mm. want? What's holding you back? What, mm-hmm. what are you stuck? And then after, you know, at the, at the end, I say, okay, here's what I'm thinking and doing. How does that hit you? How does that strike you? So I'm seeing a lot of trends and commonalities. I'm trying to get a good cross section of people within my, you know, avatar of, of customers that I have. So that's what I'm working on right now. Well, it sounds like you've got yourself planned to do this for quite some time. <laughs> you know, right. My wife jokes because I said, oh, I just I just got to take care of one little thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you always yeah, have yeah. To Oh, yeah. <laughs> so when I started but interviewing, I, I just, well, I was just going to yeah. say, she's she's used to me now when I say, she'll say, who are you interviewing? And most of the, you know, she won't know who they are because sometimes I do a lot of independent people, but, and even the famous people, she may not know who they are. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are edit days. <laughs> you know, that like stuff. I don't need to tell you any of that stuff. Well, I've and got an interview every week, and then I have a blog every week also where I take one little takeaway from the interview, and I write something about that that's focused on solving bass playing problems and achieving bass playing goals. And I used to have a weekly YouTube video, and I'm going to get back to that, and I've been threatening to start a podcast, which I think is well overdue so you know enough people do it i think the thing about it is um you're just a prime example of being bit by the music bug and can't stop you know and and making a living off of it is even great and one of the satisfactions i get is seeing people that i interviewed a year or so ago or longer that are now weaving their way to the top of the food chain I thought I was going to get the kids. I thought that's who my audience was going to be. And uh, when I started writing books, people were saying, oh, you're writing for the MTV generation. You got to write (laughs) simple, short sentences. What I did was was take my experience in the business world and in education and in music, and I formed my business. The biggest piece that I didn't have that I didn't really know anything about was the online component. Oh, yeah. And I'm by no means an expert, but I can, I'm at the point where I can hold my own and I understand how it works. And I have a very small but mighty team. So, so they help me. Well, and I think the thing is, I look at people that have three, four million people in a music business, not music stars, but people that are producers. I have three, four million people that follow them on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I'm envious, but I also know they didn't start yesterday. That's true. You know, and they all had, um, they all, it's just like our song. They had a hook, Yeah. you know, they have a, they have a hook. And, and one thing, look, the last band I was in, and this is what helped me. And, and when the guy, obviously a guitar player, so they would tell me, you know, here's the song we want to do. Well, I could sit down and learn it, but why do that? I could just go to YouTube, you know, and somebody on YouTube is going to say, here's where it's played. He plays it up here and, and you, you got to know how to play it. You still got to know how to play, but it sure saved me a lot of time, you know? Yeah. 
YouTube, in most cases, is not going to save you a lot of time. Well, when, I, it, when they want to be honest just, with the people, I say anything you need, you can find on YouTube. Yes, you, you can. Gotta sift through so much stuff and yeah. find something, test it and see if it works. And if it doesn't, then find something else and test that and see if it works. So, yeah, I'm not free, but no, you I'm, shouldn't be. I'll get you right to where you want to go right away because i've i've been there and i've done it and I've well the one thing they're getting from you is something they don't have your knowledge i mean what's the old story about you know the guy goes in and taps a button that he goes in and asks them to fix something that'll be five hundred dollars well i could have done that yeah but you didn't know which one to tap right. it's the same thing with you i mean you you have that we're just listening to your history which was very intriguing to me and all the things you've been through the one thing that was the the whole thing through is playing bass. Yeah, yeah the, the entertaining part is cool where you play there, play that, but you were just getting better all the time because you were playing. And now you instill, and the one thing you said earlier, and it's the same way with me, I remember my only, my first and only guitar teacher. That's been 60 years ago. I still remember him, his name. And like you mentioned, the person to you, you never forget that person. And the sad thing for me was, unfortunately, I realized I should reach out to him. He was already passed away. Because, you know, I wanted to say, look, this is where I am now. And if it hadn't been for you taking those two years to show me and that Mel Bay books that you put in for so long. So, well, I, I want to tell you, this has been really entertaining. I enjoyed it very much. And well, thank um, you. you got a lot of stuff going on. Got a lot of stuff. Yeah, there. All right. Well, you enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. You too. I appreciate right. it. Let me know if you need anything else. You got it, brother. See ya. Hi, I'm John Liebman, and I want to tell you about my newest Hal Leonard book. It's called Funk Jazz Bass, and it's a play in the style of book. Here's what I did. I put together a list of 30 of my favorite funk and jazz-oriented bass players, studied the subtleties and the nuances they put into their bass lines, and I wrote a bass groove in the style of each one. Now these are all my own original grooves patterned after 30 of the greatest funk jazz bass players ever. Each groove includes a paragraph about what makes each player unique, complete music notation with tablature, and access to an online video of me demonstrating each groove. So you can play along in the styles of James Jamerson. Bernard Edwards. Stanley Clark. Rocco Prestia. And all the rest. There are videos for all 30 of them. There's plenty of funky R&B, a little slapping, some fretless, everything. The book also includes an amazing foreword by none other than Nathan East, plus very, very generous endorsements from Bunny Brunel, Alain Caron, Carlitos del Puerto, Baghiti Kumalo, and Chuck Rainey. The book is called Funk Jazz Bass. It's my 10th book, not counting the transcriptions and play-along books, all published by the incredible people at Hal Leonard Corporation. It's available now. This book is sure to expand your bass grooving vocabulary big time. Funk Jazz Bass by me, John Liebman. Buy it and let's groove. <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode of The Trout Show. Thanks so much for listening, and a special thanks to John Liebman for coming on and talking about his wonderful music career and his website for bass players only. That's how you find him, and that's it for bassplayersonly.com, for bassplayersonly.com. Also, a shout-out to our supporter, Eric Finelaw. Thank you, Eric, for continuing to support our channel. For more information about more podcasts and also YouTube info, go to my website at thetroutshow.com, thetroutshow.com. So until next time, people, you know what I always say. It's only rock and roll.
but I love it. See ya.